preparing fabric. Proper fabric preparation is an important part of successful garment construction. When working with fabric, it is important to use correct terminology. Lengthwise grain runs parallel to the selvage or the finished edge on woven fabric. The crosswise grain is at right angles to lengthwise grain. True bias is located by folding the fabric so the lengthwise yarns are laying parallel to crosswise yarns, forming a 45 degree angle. It is important that the cut end on woven fabric be straight or that it follow a crosswise yarn. If woven fabric has been torn from the bolt, the torn end will follow a crosswise yarn. If, on the other hand, the fabric end has been cut, the end may not be straight and must be straightened. It can be done in a number of ways. One way is to tear a strip off the end of the fabric. The fabric will tear along a crosswise yarn. Some fabrics cannot be torn, so be sure to check using a corner of your fabric. If the fabric cannot be torn, then straighten the end by pulling a thread in the crosswise direction and cutting along the path that it makes. If the thread you pull breaks, simply cut as far as you can, then pick up the thread and pull a little further. Continue in this manner across the entire width of the fabric. It is necessary to straighten the ends of woven fabric so that you can check to see if the fabric grain is straight. After the ends of the fabric are straight, it is important to straighten the grain. To see if the grain is straight, fold the fabric in half, matching the selvage edges. Fabric should be smooth without any wrinkles. Check the end parallel to the crosswise grain. If the two layers of fabric are uneven, the fabric is off grain. It is important to straighten the grain so these ends are even before cutting into the fabric. To straighten the grain, pull the fabric on two bias to lengthen the short corner. Start by pulling in the direction of the short corner. Continue stretching on true bias the full length of the piece. Refold the fabric, again lining up the two selvage edges. The grain is straight when the ends parallel to crosswise grain are even. Pre-shrink fabric by the same care procedure you will use on the finished garment. Non-washable fabrics may be pre-shrunk by using this method. Pin the edges of the fabric together. Be sure the cut end of the fabric has been cut following a crosswise thread. Place this fabric on a wet sheet. The sheet should be thoroughly dampened and the excess moisture wrung out. Fold the extended sheet over the fabric along the ends and sides. Then fold the fabric up carefully in folds about one foot wide. It is important to keep the fabric as smooth as possible. Then fold the fabric in half crosswise and cover with a piece of plastic. Let stand six to eight hours. Unfold the fabric and smooth and stretch the fabric into shape. Allow the fabric to dry on a flat surface. Laying, pinning, and cutting a pattern. Accuracy in pinning and cutting is necessary to preserve the design and fit of the pattern. Make necessary pattern alterations and prepare the fabric before cutting. Select the pattern pieces that are a part of your design. If necessary, press pattern pieces using a warm but dry iron. If there is a prominent fold in the fabric, press it out before cutting. Check to see if the fold has been discolored. If so, try to refold the fabric to avoid using the discolored portion. If a lap zipper is part of the design, 
you may want to increase the seam allowance where the zipper is to be located to one inch. Remember that if a facing is involved, you will want to increase the corresponding seam allowance on that pattern piece also to one inch. Side seams are often increased to one inch to give a little more allowance for fitting. This should not take the place of altering the pattern, however. Refer to the instruction sheet for a suggested layout. When using pile or napped fabric, all pattern pieces must be placed in the same direction. Fabric is usually folded with wrong sides together. Lay each pattern piece so the marked grain line on the pattern runs parallel to lengthwise grain or to the selvage edge on woven fabric. Measure from the grain line marking to the selvage or straight grain fold, and then pin the pattern at each end of the grain line marking. If you are working with plaids, stripes, or other fabric requiring matching, you would have to consider that when placing the pattern. Smooth the pattern in all directions from the grain line marking, and place pins along the pattern edges. Pins are usually placed in the seam allowance close to the cutting line. You will probably want pins every four to five inches in order to hold the pattern securely in place. When you have finished pinning, recheck to see that you have included all of the pattern pieces necessary for your design. All cutting must be done accurately by carefully following the heavy marked line on the pattern piece. Cut as much of the pattern with the grain as possible. That means to cut from high to low in the case of the shoulder seam and from wide to narrow for side seams. Keep the portion of the pattern that you are cutting as close to the table as possible so that your shears are resting on the table as you cut. Bent handled shears will help you in keeping the fabric flat. Notice that notches are cut out away from the seam allowance. You can use a small notch or a very small snip into the seam allowance to mark center front or center back when they are placed on a fold. The same procedure can also be used at the top of a sleeve. Be sure that the blades on your shears are sharp, as dull ones tend to chew the fabric. Cut all of the pattern pieces out at one time and leave the pattern pinned to the fabric until all necessary markings have been transferred to the fabric. Transferring Pattern Markings The method used for transferring pattern markings to the fabric depends on the characteristics of that fabric. The tracing wheel and tracing paper can be used on many fabrics so long as the markings do not show through to the right side of the material. Remove only enough pins to allow the carbon paper to be inserted between the layers of fabric. Protect the working surface so it won't be damaged by the tracing wheel. Place a double sheet of tracing paper between the fabric layers so the markings will be transferred to the wrong side of the fabric. A ruler can be used as a guide for making straight lines, such as on darts. Other markings to be transferred include pleats, tucks, center front, buttonholes, and pocket placement. This technique would not be suitable when using sheer material or light colored fabrics as the markings could show through to the right side of the material. Taylor's tax is another method of transferring pattern markings and is suitable for most fabrics. Taylor's tax are made with a double thread. Take a very small stitch through the pattern and both layers of fabric, leaving about one inch of thread. Take a second stitch directly on top of the first. Pull up the second stitch until a one inch loop is formed. Repeat this procedure at each of the dots to be marked or transferred to the fabric. If there is a long distance between dots, the thread can be cut about one inch from the dot. It is important that each stitch be kept as small as possible so that the markings will be accurate. Clip the thread between the stitches, but do not clip the loop formed at each dot. Unpin the pattern and pull the loop through the pattern. Hold on to the threads as you remove the pattern as the loop will make a small hole in the pattern. 
Then separate the two layers of fabric for about one half inch and clip the threads between the fabric layers. This technique gives you markings which can be seen on both the right and wrong side of the fabric. Pins can be used as a quick method of transferring pattern markings. Place a pin through the pattern and the two layers of fabric. From the underside, put a second pin through the fabric in the opposite direction right beside the first. The dots closest to the seam allowance can be marked by making a very small clip into the seam allowance. These clips should be kept very short. Unpin the pattern and separate the two layers. There should be a pin in each layer. Before removing the pin, take a small stitch with the pin to mark the dark point. You must be careful when using this technique so that the pins do not fall out. Some markings need to show on the right side of the fabric, such as the one indicating the placement for a patch pocket. This can be done by using a long hand basting stitch following the pocket marking, the distance between the stitches being about one inch. Then clip between each of the stitches and carefully remove the pattern. This type of marking would need to be done on each fabric layer separately. Other markings that may be transferred in this way include center front or center back lines, fold line for facing, and pleat lines. After removing the pattern, the thread markings remain in the fabric. Interfacing a button opening. Interfacing is used to reinforce a button opening. Two methods are illustrated here. The first method is appropriate to use when the pattern has a back neck facing along with a front facing. It is important that center front and fold line markings be transferred to the fabric. This can be done using a tracing wheel or with hand basting. The interfacing is cut the same shape as the facing and is placed on the wrong side of the fabric with one edge along the fold line. Pin close to the outer edge of the facing. Machine stitch the two layers together, stitching one half inch from the raw edge along the shoulder seam and one fourth inch from the inner edge of the facing. Interfacing is usually cut from fabric which is similar in weight or lighter in weight than the garment fabric. It is cut with lengthwise grain running parallel to the fold line in order to add stability to the opening. The inner edge is stitched near the fold line, either by machine or by hand. The machine stitching is being shown here. The hand stitching will be illustrated later. When machine stitching is used, start the stitching at the location of the top button. If the outer edge will be finished by turning and edge stitching, trim the interfacing close to the machine stitching. If zigzagging will be used, then do not trim the interfacing. Attach the front facing to the back neck facing at the shoulder seam. Press seams open, then trim to one fourth inch. One way to finish the raw edge of the facing is to turn an edge stitch. Fold the edge of the facing over the interfacing along the first line of stitching and finger press. This should be about one fourth inch. Machine stitch close to the folded edge. Continue stitching around the back neck facing and down the other side. The second method of attaching interfacing is appropriate to use when there is no back neck facing and the upper collar finishes the back neckline. The center front and fold line markings are transferred to the fabric with basting thread. The interfacing is cut the same size and shape as the facing, 
but this time it is placed on the right side of the fabric with one edge along the fold line. Pin the interfacing to the fashion fabric, placing pins close to the outer edge of the facing. Machine stitch along this edge one fourth inch from the raw edge. Continue stitching across the shoulder seam along the seam line. It is important to check your pattern to see if a one fourth inch or five eighths inch seam allowance was allowed for at the shoulder seam of the facing. Layer the shoulder seam allowance of the facing if necessary and trim away excess fabric at the corner. This is necessary because the interfacing will be turned to the wrong side. To help in turning and pressing the interfacing, understitch along this seam, turning the seam allowance toward the interfacing and stitching close to that seam. Notice that the stitching is on the interfacing side of the seam. You will only be able to understitch to within an inch or so of the corner. Since the shoulder seam was not understitched, Press the seam open using the point presser, then turn the facing to the wrong side, carefully manipulating the fabric to get a sharp corner. Press along the edge. Notice how helpful the understitching is in turning the seam and unrolling the seam toward the interfacing during pressing. Attach the inner edge of the interfacing along the fold line. This time a hand catch stitch is being illustrated. For a right-handed person, the catch stitch is made working left to right. Small stitches are taken alternately between the fashion fabric along the fold line and the interfacing. Take each stitch one half inch to the right of the previous stitch. The finished stitch gives a cross-stitched appearance. Using fusible interfacings. Fusible interfacings have some form of adhesive on one side of the fabric and are attached to the garment by steam, heat, and pressure. Before using fusible interfacing, it is important to understand the different types that are available. There are basically three types of fusible interfacings. There is the woven interfacing. It is the most stable of the three and will have very little give in either the lengthwise or crosswise direction. Then there is the all bias interfacing that has some give in all directions. This interfacing would add body to the garment area to which it is attached but will not stabilize. The third type has stretch in one direction only, usually in the crosswise direction. There are both non-woven interfacings and knitted fusible interfacings that have one-way stretch. A portion of the seam allowance should be trimmed from the interfacing before fusing it to the fashion fabric. If the garment section is to be top-stitched, the entire seam allowance can be trimmed. Usually only a part of the seam allowance is trimmed before fusing, so that the interfacing can be included in the machine stitching. Place the fusible side of the interfacing against the wrong side of the garment piece. Fuse base by touching the tip of the iron at regular intervals to hold the interfacing in place. A damp press cloth is usually used when attaching the interfacing. Place the iron over the damp press cloth and hold for 10 to 15 seconds. Then lift the iron and move to the next spot and hold for the same amount of time. Allow the fabric to cool thoroughly before handling. Then lift one corner to check the fusing. There are areas requiring special attention when using fusible interfacing. If an all bias or one way stretch interfacing was used for a facing, the area behind a buttonhole requires the addition of a second layer that does not stretch in the direction of the buttonhole. 
A piece of woven interfacing or one-way stretch cut so that it is stable in the crosswise direction could be used. This will prevent the buttonhole from stretching when the garment is buttoned. Patch pockets cut from knit fabric may have a tendency to sag after use. They can be reinforced with fusible interfacing before being attached to the garment. This pocket will be top stitched to the garment, so the interfacing was removed from the seam allowance. When the interfacing is used inside a collar, it is usually applied to only the upper collar. If more stability is desired in the neckband, the interfacing can be attached to both layers of the neckband. To reduce bulk in a dark, the dark can be removed from the interfacing before fusing it to the fashion fabric. Notice that the interfacing extends to just the stitching line for the dark. This is the front of a tailored jacket. Fusible interfacing is often applied to the entire jacket front piece to give the shaping necessary for a tailored look. The facing for the jacket front also should be interfaced. The interfacing may extend just to the marked row line or the entire facing may be interfaced. Remember that when an edge is to be top stitched, the entire seam allowance may be trimmed from the interfacing, therefore removing some bulk from the seam allowance. Fusible interfacing can also be used for reinforcing areas of strain on a garment. An example of this would be to reinforce a square corner before it is clipped, such as this bottom section for a V yoke. Underlining techniques. Underlining adds body to a garment and prevents stretching in areas of strain. It will also help to prevent construction details from showing through on sheer fabrics. An underlining is cut the same size and shape as the garment piece. It is placed on the wrong side of each section before any seams are sewn. Pin the two layers together, working on a flat surface to keep the fabric flat and smooth. If the underlining is to go only to the hem fold line, shorten the underlining by the width of the hem. If you are unsure as to where the hemline will be, the underlining can be shortened later. Hand or machine baste the two sections together, about one half inch from the edge. It is somewhat easier to control the fabric with hand basting than with machine stitching. These stitches should be fairly close together to keep the two layers from shifting. The same procedure would be used when underlining pants. If an edge finish is necessary, such as zigzagging, both the underlining and garment fabric can be finished together. When darts are a part of the design of an underlined garment, the two layers should be stitched together just inside the dart line before stitching the dart. The two layers of fabric will fold easier if the lining is slashed along the dart fold line. Then fold the dart matching the dart lines. Pin parallel to and directly on the dart stitching line. Check the placement of pins on both sides to be sure the stitching will follow the marked dart lines. Stitch the dart following the marked lines. As you can see, the first machine stitching helps to keep the two layers of fabric from slipping. This is especially important at the point of the dart. The second stitching should be deeper than the previous stitching so that the first stitching will not show. A 
For heavier fabric, the dart will be less bulky if the dart is cut along the fold line and pressed open. It is also important on your heavier fabrics to place paper under each side of the dart so the dart edges will not cause imprints on the right side of the fabric. If possible, press the dart over a pressing cushion or pressing ham to help retain the shape created by the dart. A damp press cloth could also be used when pressing if additional moisture is needed to get a smooth, flat dart. A second method of stitching darts in a garment which is underlined would be to stitch them separately in each layer before basting the two layers together. There are two ways to hem an underlined garment. The underlining may extend to just the hem fold line. Fold up the garment along the marked hemline and press. It is important that the width of the hem be uniform around the entire garment. The edge of the hem should be finished before hand stitching the hem to the underlining. The other method would be to extend the underlining to the bottom of the garment. If the underlining is left in the hem, Baste through the two layers along the hem fold line before turning up the hem. Fold up the hem and press along the hem fold line. This method would add more body to the hem area. The hem edge could be finished in a number of ways, such as zigzagging or with seam binding. A special edge finish, called the Hong Kong finish, is illustrated here. When possible, place the hemming stitches between the hem and the garment. A lock stitch is being illustrated here. When hemming, stitch the hem to the underlining only, so that the hem will not show on the outside of the garment. Notice that the hem is not attached to the fashion fabric. An underlining is an excellent way to add body to a garment and to prevent stretching in areas of strain.